Alright. We're starting at first uh, look 1425 through uh, 35. In verses 25 and 20 through 27, the multitudes were following Jesus. You, you read that in the, in the 25th verse. The multitudes are following Jesus. One of the things that you always have to remember about the anointing is that the anointing attracts. Amen. The, the anointing is attractive. So what happens is that one that has an anointing in a particular area, spiritual people are going to discern that. And they're going to want to be around them. They're going to want to follow them. Amen. So the multitudes were, were following Jesus because they discerned the anointing on him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, it says, as you go through 25 to 27, it says, it talks about hating your mother, father, sister, brother, and your children and your family. Now, I want to make sure that, that we understand what this word hate means. It don't mean hate like we think hate. Uh, are y'all with me? The, the, the Greek word for hate here is misio, M-I-S-E-O, and it means, it can mean to love less, okay? So when it talks about hating someone, particularly in this particular section, they're talking about loving less. So it's not a matter of hatred, ugh, but what they're saying basically here is that Jesus should be the most important thing in your life. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Even in comparison to mother, father, sister, brother, children, that Jesus should be most important. Amen? Make sense? Somebody give me Matthew 6.33, a very well-known verse of scripture. But I want to show you how that fits in here. Matthew 6.33, whoever, whoever has it can read it for us. We ought to be able to quote that one. Yeah, keep seeking first the kingdom, and all these other things will be added to you. Hallelujah. Lord says that it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? See, those of you that, that have been with me for a while, I always talk about teaching line upon line, precept upon precept, right? So if you just snatch that verse out of the, the scripture, you won't know what beast they are. Come on. So, so if you read above that, they're talking about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, wherewithal you should be clothed, what you're going to wear. Mm -hmm. And above it, it says, your heavenly father knoweth that you have need of these things. So he's telling you, he says, take no thought for your life. In other words, don't worry. Somebody say, don't worry. Don't worry. Say it again. Somebody say, don't worry. Don't worry. Hallelujah. <laughs> because God's got you covered. Well, my God's got you covered, so don't worry. The Bible says, be careful. That means to be pulled in different directions in group. You, know, yeah. you say don't worry. Now I'm going to find the bottom of the fence on like day. Don't worry, be happy. That's it. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we're talking about here. is not worrying. Apostle Turner used to teach that worry is the misuse of imagination. And it really is. It really is. Because with us being saved, knowing what the Bible says, you shouldn't worry. And what's interesting, where it says, be careful. Yes, ma'am. Sure it is. Sure it is. Where it says in Philippians, be careful for nothing. That word careful is the Greek word moreneo, and it means to be pulled in different directions. Isn't this wonderful? God is so good. So that word careful means to be pulled in different directions. When you worry, aren't you pulled in different directions? Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. When you worry, aren't you pulled in different directions? Can't pay this bill on this side. Come on. 
kids acting not acting right on that side. Ain't nobody praying with me. So when you worry, you're being pulled apart. You're being pulled in different directions, and that's what that word means. Are y'all with me? Hallelujah. So it says, don't worry about anything. It says, be careful for nothing, Philippians 4, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. In other words, if I can break this down in the black version, those, those, first, those two verses, 4, 6, and 7 says, don't worry about anything. What's my Jason? What, what's wrong? Oh, okay. Okay. So it says, be careful for nothing, but everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So it says, if you don't worry about stuff, and you pray about everything, then the peace of God shows up. Isn't that Amen. wonderful? Amen. Hallelujah. So what that basically saying in Philippians 4, 6 through 7 or so, is saying, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Amen. Come on. Amen. And that's very important that we grasp that. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. So, when they talk about hating your family, they ain't talk about hate like hit you in the mouth hate. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> well, God said, oh, okay. No. No, they're talking about where it says, seek ye first, Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, wherewithal shall you be clothed, shall be added unto you. So what that's telling you is, and you know what's interesting? Saints sometimes overreact to stuff. So it don't say you can't seek something second, third, fourth, and fifth. No, ain't, ain't, no, ain't nobody. Amen. It just says seek him. What? First. First. It don't say what you do second. Okay. Or what else you got on your list? Come on, somebody. Yeah. You can have a second and a third. Just seek Jesus. First. Hold on, I feel my teacher coming. Hallelujah. Just make sure he's at the top of the list. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because his righteousness goes along with him, and all these things. So if you're sick, can I exegete this for you? I'm going to do it anyway. So, so what he's saying, well, I said, go ahead. Uh, so what they're saying is, if you seek Jesus first, not your children first, not your job first, not that husband, some of the sisters want. By the way, I have a question. Why do they say husband like that? Why do they, why do they say husband? Why do they, why do they do that? You know, I heard a preacher. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, um, seek ye first, number one, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things. This is your answer right here. Matthew 6, 33, then y'all never put together like this. This is your answer to every need that you have. Amen. Oh, it's quiet. Can't pay that bill. Seek, seek, seek first the kingdom. Oh, it's quiet. Amen. They ain't treated like seek first the kingdom. Well, I have a lot. Seek first the kingdom. And the, Bible, and the Bible says, if you seek his kingdom first, all these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, where all you should be clothed, all your needs shall be added. Come on now. Can I teach? Can I teach God add real good? And ain't nobody praying. He, huh? he don't need an add machine because he God. And he going to make sure if you seek him first, if he's at the top of your list of your seat, He's going to put you in a position for your needs to be met. Are y'all learning something? Amen. See, a lot of people never looked at Matthew 6.33 as a verse to put you in a position to, to answer your needs. Hey, Mom. 
to answer your needs, but Matthew 6.33 is telling you put him first. That's all he has. Your needs are answered. All these things, these things, look at the verses above. What you eat, what you drink, all your needs are going to be met, and then God gets to ask. Come on, somebody. All them and there you go. Don't be all them. He all know about exactly. The Bible says he knows what things you need, what, before you ask him, right? All right. He's omniscient. Come on now. That means he know everything. That means he know everything. All know He's also omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at the same time. And isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? He's, he's also omnipotent. omnipotent. That means he's all powerful. Who wouldn't want to serve a guy like that? Hallelujah. Okay. I got I got revelation on this section from Luke 14, 25 and 35. That's where we are to today in the lesson. That I had never gotten before. That, that's how. That's why I love the Word of God because you can have read stuff and studied it, and think you know it. Oh, it's quiet in this Lutheran Sunday school class. But then you're looking at it one day, you can do something, whatever, and then God gives you a whole new revelation. It's like you never saw that verse before. Come on. So in Luke 14, 25 through 27. They're telling you, hate your brother, or hate your mother, brother, sister, all that. And then it goes on. What they're saying there in that section is that this is a condition of discipleship. Somebody say a condition of discipleship. One of the conditions of discipleship is that Jesus is more important than your mom. Oh, ain't nobody, ain't nobody. Huh? More important than auntie. Ain't nobody praying. Yeah. Ain't nobody praying with me. Hallelujah. Brother, sister, mama, daddy. More important. He's got to be more. This is one of the keys to discipleship. Are y'all learning something? Yeah. Is everything else has to be less important than Jesus. Somebody say less important, less important. Less important. than Jesus. Oh God, I feel that. Go down both shot by bye. Then it goes on to say, I think in verse 27, it says that you got to take up your cross and follow him. Amen? What do you think, what do y'all think that, that means, take up your cross and follow him? What does that mean? Yeah, but what's the, yes? Your own, Good, 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 good. She, she said your own agenda. So, so, somebody else, what's the cross, what does taking up your cross mean? What does that mean? Me taking up your responsibility. Good, good. If if you look at the notes I have here, your cross can means things that can cause you pain and persecution. Oh, because Jesus. of your stand for Christ. Oh, Jason, stop hollering like that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody read for me Luke nine twenty three through twenty four. Luke nine twenty three through twenty four. Somebody. Go on. Hallelujah. Somebody said, somebody said, her day. Every day. every day. It says, take up your cross every day. Don't miss Thursday. What, what's the matter? Don't miss Saturday. It says every day. So they're talking, what, what are they talking here? They're talking a consistency here. Amen? I mentioned earlier that they follow Jesus because the anointing is attractive. The anointing attracts people. And I pointed out when they said hate is the Greek word. Uh, it said you got to hate your mother, father, sister, sister, brother. That word hate is the Greek word misio, M-I-S-E-O. And in Greek, one of the definitions that, that applies here is that it means to love less. So when it says hate your mother, mother, father, sister, brother, what that really means here is to love them less than you love Jesus. Hallelujah. So that's one of the criteria for discipleship is to love that family member or whatever less than you love Jesus. 
can I take that a step further? It also, that little section, they use the concept of family because that's important to most people. But you can take that in all different types of directions. Let's talk about the person that wants to be CEO of the, of the company. Oh, ain't, ain't, ain't nobody praying. And that's more important than Jesus. Molly. Yes. Oh. This is one of the things about time. Uh-huh. So maybe I'll give an answer. Okay. So I work at the out of town church. Okay. And so Joe, they are going to honor uh, the gay conversation. Yeah. They're going to put up a big gay flag. Uh-huh. Gay flag. A flag. Mm-hmm. Right in the town. Mm-hmm. But then they pass out buttons. They gave you a choice if you want to try to go get such a story so it's often death and get it. But now they make a t-shirt, they want to wrap it a whole lot of show, but put two pictures of, you know, actually out there in And I'm saying, I'm like, I didn't say nobody. Mm-hmm. I don't feel that good to participate in it because mm-hmm. it's just the cause that I'm not supposed to cause another church to be innocent to be innocent right. on hand. Right. But I know they're doing it for a whole lot. Then they can't exactly. go out to where the church got to but then they came with Black History Black History Month. And what they did is Black History Month, they put up videos and just keep giving emphasis about different African American people. They put up how people that are important. Uh-huh. You know? And then to me, I'm saying, I they let these people say they want to promote it. Everyone that said it's gay stuff, did a video or put up videos of people that's African American. But I haven't said nothing to nobody, but mm-hmm. I don't feel that. Like what I would do, right. Molly, right. I do just what you do, right. and I pray. And I would just, right. somehow or another, not, not wind up with a shirt. Gee, I don't know what happened, but I just. Right. Mm. I never got one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What I would do is I wouldn't wear it. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. then, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Father God, we just come before you on this morning. We give you all the honor, the praise, and glory. We thank you, O God, that we are giving our offering unto you with a cheerful heart, O God. We thank you, O God, that you are our provider, you are our protector, O God. And we love you and we continue to just honor you and praise you for all that you have done and yet to do in our lives each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, I didn't know who had said that. Okay. Oh. No problem. Oh, Oh, of course, yeah. Co- coalition. Yeah, and you should be because because we stand for something different. Verses 14, 28 through 33. In these sections, Jesus uses two analogies to explain counting up the cost to be a disciple. Somebody say count the cost. So in this section, 28 through 33, the first thing that they said is, you know, if a man's going to build a tower, he has to sit down and consider the cost that he has enough to build. Are you with me? So Jesus confessed what? He could, we ain't talking about towers, Elder Cole. I'm glad you asked that question. He's talking about towers because he's doing an analogy. Somebody say an analogy. An analogy. And the analogy is he's comparing the cost of discipleship to building a tower. Are you, are you with me? Jesus is saying here that the cost of discipleship is like building a tower. And the reason why he says that is because it's a major undertaking. You have to consider a whole bunch of stuff when you're considering whether or not you want to be a disciple or not. Mm-hmm. Just like if you're going to build a tower, you've got to consider what? Building material? Come on. You have to consider workmen. You've got to consider money to pay the workmen. Come on. Right. See, these are things that we don't think about. So this is when you go, if you're going to build a tower, you don't just go out and say, I'm going to build me a tower. You have to plan. 
So what they're saying here is for the disciple, if you're going to be a disciple, you have to what? Plan. Huh? You have to consider what is it going to cost you. You have to consider, huh, that maybe Aunt Letty ain't, let, ain't, ain't going to like you no more. Well, ain't nobody praying with me. Huh? I, I said, Aunt, Aunt Letty might not like you no more. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> Molly, you've been here with, with me 30 years or more. I never knew that was your mother's name. My God. So, so, the, so we're saying here that probably some family members, ain't nobody praying, yeah. going to be upset with you. Huh? Oh, oh, all right. So, so I was prophetic then. Go down both sides then. Hey, go both sides. <laughs> Wrong, but they never think about the right. Exactly. Exactly. They never think about what you say, when you're going to come and you know, Exactly. Before they judge you about what y'all, that's not right. That's not right. What about the right? Not, you know. And let me t tell you something else about that, too. This is another example of how the enemy comes against us. Now, you say, now, come on. Love Jesus, filled with the Holy Ghost and that with the burning fire. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah, you got all that going now. But your cousin, remember when you used to smoke dope with, with them? Oh, ain't nobody saying people of the Colbert. And all they're going to dwell on is the old you, the old sinful you, before the blood hits you. Have you noticed that they like to bring up that you used to do. You ain't doing it no more. You got saved. The blood erases the history. Come on, somebody. So, they're comparing discipleship to, uh, by the way, this is Luke, this section is Luke 14, 25 through 35. Luke 14, 25 through 35. Now I'm dealing with verses 28 through 32. They're talking about comparing building a tower to becoming a disciple. The reason why we got all these analogies about building a tower and deciding whether you, you, you know, you're like a king, you got to decide whether you're, you're going to go to war. Somebody might say, what's that got to do with discipleship? A lot. Because you have to make decisions about things if you decide that you want to become a disciple. Hallelujah. So you have to consider, just like you got to consider building materials and, and work, workers and stuff, if you're going to build a tower, you have to consider the, thank you, I just heard this. You have to consider the, the investment that you have to put into it to be a disciple. Huh? Huh? Can I teach that? One of the investments is you got to go to church when you don't feel like it. Oh, <laughs> Ain't nobody saying teach Elder Colbert. Hallelujah. It's a press. And you know what I've learned is when you press, God really moves for you when you didn't feel like it. But you came anyway. Come on, somebody. And then you see the blessings manifest in your life because you obey him. Make sense? So, then, in verses 29 and 30, they say, okay, well, what if you start building the tower? Uh -huh. Start to build a tower, but then what if you pour the foundation of the tower, right? You pour the foundation of the tower, but then you ran out of building material. Oh God! So I say, uh oh, you you poured the foundation, you got started, but then you ran out of money. Ain't nobody praying with me, huh? Yeah. And you can't now. You can't continue building the tower because you don't have enough material. You don't have the money for the material. And guess what's gonna happen to you then? 
Yeah. You're mean people gonna talk about you. They gonna say, oh, you, you come on, you started doing that towel, but what? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. 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 And I was gonna go do that, but I got trying to finish this lesson and start up the other one because this is the last time in the book. So people are watching you all the time. The Bible says that the wicked watch the righteous and seek the slave. They're always watching us. Hoping you make a mistake so they can talk about you. Come on. And the and the scripture says that you started build to, to build a tower. Listen, the analogy is you started working for Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. You joined the church and bought yourself a big Bible. Come on, somebody. <laughs> bought a big Bible. Hmm? Coming to church, but then persecution mm -hmm. show up. I feel my teacher coming now. Hallelujah. I had planned to say this. I'm getting this right now. Persecution show up, and it gets difficult for you to come to church. You tired now. Ain't nobody praying with you. Huh? I work late today. I don't feel like going to church on no Wednesday. I had to work two extra hours, so I ain't going. Huh? And, huh, and before you would talk about how good Jesus is. Huh? To your family and friends. Huh? But now you but now they ain't been to church in three months. That's an example of you started, but you didn't finish. Come on, somebody. And then they're going to do what? Talk about you. So that's why this section is telling us that, that you need to consider the cost of being a disciple. Another reason why you got to consider the cost of being a disciple is because the devil ain't going to like it. <laughs> the devil is not going to like you working for Jesus, and he's going to come against you. Let me give you an example. I didn't even realize what was happening until later when the Holy Ghost told me. So on Wednesday, I wasn't at Bible study because Apostle Lathan asked me to go to uh, Bowling Brook and preach for, for, for Apostle Mary and Apostle Tim. So I preached on Wednesday. It was great. God moved and all that. Got back in my car to go home. I was tired too. Listen, I was tired. I was ready to go home. Virtue had departed from me. Are y'all with me? I got in my car, couldn't wait to get home, and I heard something go, poof. I said, oh, what is that? And I was like, I hear, poof, 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 poof. I said, oh, no. I went. That was a flat. Now, let me, now, now, what happened. I was nowhere but on the expressway. So evidently, there was something sticking out, and it was dark. It was like nine something, so I couldn't really see. And I'm like, what was in the middle of the, of the expressway, and why did it get in my tire? Ain't nobody playing with me. Why me? I know why me. Because the devil didn't like I just got through preaching. And people were encouraged. Come on. So the next morning, I took it to Curran, and, and he, he showed me the tire, and there was this big metal thing stuck in it. He couldn't even fix it. I had to get another tie. And I'm like, my thought process, I didn't say it to him. But I was thinking, so how in the world did this get in the middle of 294 in my lane, right when I'm finished preaching? I'm tired and I won't go home. Are y'all with me? This is an example of backlash. The devil don't like you working for God. But then, the other end of it also says, God blesses you. Are you with me? So God moved. God, you know, got an honorarium for going. Ain't nobody for Oh, thank you, Jesus. Uh, hallelujah. But I really wasn't expecting. So, the enemy was real mad. But see, that's an example of somebody say, the, the cost of discipleship. That kind of stuff happens to you sometimes because the devil, listen, 
can you go lay hands on the sick and they recover you go preach and get people saved and do eulogies and get people saved and the devil don't do nothing to you he wouldn't be a good devil would he come on he gonna come against you so that's one of the costs of discipleship is the enemy messing with you are y'all with me all right so then you go on a, a little bit further Jesus, what, what Jesus is saying in this section about building a tower, th then he goes on to say that it's very important for you to finish what you started. Amen? Don't stop it. Don't even, what, what he's basically saying is don't even stop building the tower if you don't have enough to finish building it. Are we learning? Amen? So, and the reason why is because people are watching and they're waiting for you to fail. Because you say to love Jesus. Come on. The blood has hit you. Come on, somebody. And the devil doesn't like that. So, so the next analogy for, for discipleship is the king getting ready to go to war. Somebody say the king getting ready to go to war. Are y'all learning something? Yes. Do you remember reading about counting up the cost and the king getting ready to go to war before somewhere in the scriptures at some point? Now we got the understanding. The reason why he did this is, is because he wants us to understand the cost of discipleship. Huh? I hadn't got it like this until I started studying it like this. I read it a whole bunch of times. I taught it before, but this time I got something different. See, I was teaching in in in, in, Bolton, in Bolton Brook on Wednesday. The the word is alive. The word of God is quick. That means alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing of soul of the soul and spirit, joints and marrows, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. It's alive. And the reason why you know it's alive is because you can read it, like I said earlier, and think you knew it, and then one day you read it again, and it's like you never read it before. You get stuff, and that's because it's alive. Are you? Somebody say it's alive. It's alive. Mm -hmm. it's alive. So now I understand that the counting up the cost is the cost of discipleship. Now I understand that the planning for war for the king is like your discipleship. Because if you look at that section, it says you got to stop and, and consider whether you got enough soldiers to win the war. Come on, come on, somebody. And then, but then it also says you have to quickly, somebody say quickly, you have to quickly decide whether you got enough to win or not. If you decide you don't have enough to win, you have to go to the enemy and, and desire peace, a peace talk. Come on, hallelujah, because you know you ain't gonna win. But all this is part of your planning. In other words, if you know you you ain't gonna win, you're not supposed to just go out there anyway. Come on, somebody, like some of us might do. Not 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 y'all, but at some other churches might might do. Hallelujah. Huh? Can you say, well, I don't, I don't start it now. I might as well go out there and get everybody killed. I I decided to go. <laughs> By one and order, one more order. But you don't have to order Uh-huh, right, right, right. Yeah, right, but right, you, right. And, but you said they wanted out of 18 years, I mean, we're supposed to be out of 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they got it, then they put it. Of course they do. Of course they do. So the first analogy of, of discipleship, building the tower, that's analogous to deciding whether you, you're taking time to decide whether you're going to follow Jesus or not, period. You got to decide. Is it worth it? Huh? Is it worth the persecution? Huh? Is it worth your cousin telling you that, that your Bible is too big? Come on, somebody. Then the second part, the king preparing for war is analogous to whether he's deciding quickly whether he should follow Jesus or not. So you got to make up your mind quickly about this war thing. Am I going to do it or am I not going to do it? Yes, sir. Speaking of persecution and everything, 
in Matthew 5, it says, Blessed are ye which are persecuted, the righteous say. When men shall revile you and persecute uh -huh. you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake, he said, he rejoice. Said, rejoice. Be glad. Now let, let's talk about that. Thank, thank you, Jesus. Wait a minute. It's, 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 it says, be happy. Your flesh ain't happy. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody right? Unless you're spiritual, you ain't happy about people talking about you and saying your head too big. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. That don't make you happy. Don't make your flesh happy. But you're happy because you know, like the man of God says, that great is your reward in heaven. In that one. Glory to God. And another point I want to point out, Elder says, Jesus said, in me you're going to have peace, but in the world you have tribulation. Tribulation. Be of good cheer. Well, be of good cheer. In, in other words, in other words, the fight's already been fought. And Jesus has already overcome the world. Hallelujah. So now, it goes on further to say, he says again, it's almost like the rich young, young ruler again. It says you got to give up everything you have to follow Jesus. Huh? Your, wait, what do you mean by that, Cobra? Your agenda. Oh, it's quiet in this Lutheran Sunday school class. <laughs> what you want to do Hmm? Holly, your plan, because sometimes our plans are God's plans. So we have to be cognizant of that, that, we, that we're doing what God wants us to do and not what we want to do. We have a tendency to, to want to do what we want to do. And it might not be God's will. Amen? Then it goes on to say, then they start talking about salt. They talk about the salt losing its savor. So why they do that? Because the salt represents the saints. If you're a disciple, you're salt. Let me tell you something about salt. Did you know that during Bible time, when they paid the soldiers, sometimes they paid the soldiers not in money, but in salt? Did you know that? Because salt was very precious during that time. Sometimes you just get, did you ever hear the term, he's not worth his salt? Ever, ever heard that? The reason why they said it is because salt was more important than money during that time. Sometimes the soldiers were paid with salt. Because salt not only seasons, but salt does, does a lot of stuff. Salt melts ice. You put salt, oh, come on. Salt draws water. That's how come when you eat something salty, you want water. Because the water is going to help to dilute that salt. Yes, and that's where I was going next, Evangelist. Salt brings flavor to what you're eating. We as saints should bring a little flavor. Come on, somebody, to the world. The Bible talks about, in Matthew 5, the Bible talks about that we're the salt of the world and we're a city sit on a hill. We're the light of the world. So we ought to be salt and, somebody say salt and light. Both salt and light draw attention. Come on somebody, light draws attention, salt draws attention. Hallelujah. Salt is used for seasoning. One of the many things that it's used for is seasoning. So you make the world taste better. Come on, somebody. You make the world taste better because you're salt and you're seasoning. Now, I'm going to run to Uther. Now we're going to do the second lesson. That's Luke 16, 1 through 12. Somebody say, Luke. 16, 1 through 12. Somebody read that for me right quick. I'll, I'll see how far I can get into the second, second lesson. A steward is a manager. Uh -huh. no, no, I mean uh, uh, in, the, in the Bible. Luke 16, 1 through 12. Luke 16, 1 through 12. Somebody read that for me.
Amen. Give the woman of God a hand. That's good. Now, let me tell you something. Most of us have read this. Okay, this was Luke 16, 1 through 12. This is lesson two. She just read Luke 16, 1 through 12. Okay? I got revelation out of this that I had never gotten before. For all these years, I had not gotten this until I recently studied this this time. Are y'all with me? The first thing, this guy's a steward. What's a steward? Yeah. Yeah. A steward is basically a manager. Okay? So the steward is managing his master's place for him. His resources for him, his business for him. Okay. Now, the steward handled the business of his master. Now, you gotta understand, the steward don't own nothing. The steward manages what belongs to the master. The Bible says that we are stewards. So that means that we don't own nothing. We think we do, but I can prove to you that you don't own nothing. As a part of this, you say, in I can prove it to you because, what's the matter, Deacon? Because I've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it. That's right, you can. So that proves the Bible says you come in, you're going to leave here like you came in. Huh? Right. So, so what they're saying is he's the manager. He wasn't the owner, but he was manager. Oh, and by the way, this steward wasn't no good. Somebody say he wasn't no good. He was a liar and a cheat, and all he cared about was himself. I said, he, I said the steward was a liar and a cheat and selfish. And all he cared about was the stuff. Now listen. So the rich man, I guess stuff was coming up missing. <laughs> Didn't the word go so good? Come on. So the so the master show, comes up and says, and this is the part that I missed, that this is so good. I missed this all these years. He tells him, he didn't give him a chance. See, I thought he was giving him a chance. He was not giving him a chance. He said, give an account. See, when he said give an account of your stewardship, I thought he was saying, all these years, I thought he was saying, okay, we're well, well, giving an account, we're going to look it over. No. Because right behind it, he says, you shall no longer be steward. He fired him right then. Are y'all learning something? He fired him on the spot. Okay? 
so he don't have a job anymore. And he fired him on the spot because he said he, he I guess he had enough evidence to prove that he wasn't doing right. All right. So the rich man, which I want, if you don't get anything else out of this session, and you again, if you read it again, understand he fired him right at the beginning of this section. He fired him in the second verse. Bam, gone. All right? So he fired him. So now listen, man. If you were the manager, but you ain't the manager no more, you can you can say whatever you want to and do whatever you want to because the master can't do nothing to you because you don't work for him anymore. Are you learning something? You are no longer the steward. You are no longer the manager. That's how come he went to the people that owed his master money and lowered the amount that they owed him. Are you learning something? He could do that because his boss can't do nothing to it. <laughs> huh? So he goes to these people, he lowers the amount that they owe him, and the reason why he did that was he trying to help his own cause. He said, he, you know, he's thinking, okay, now they see I've, I've lowered you. He tell them, I did this for you, okay? I made it so you got to pay the whole amount, amen? So this is gonna make these people like him because you saved me money, are you with me? So they're gonna be on his side now that he's lost his job, are y'all learning something? That makes sense. That makes sense. He <laughs> said, they, they're going to be there. They'll, they'll help me now. But the part that I had really missed was he already fired him. And the reason, because I used to think, so, okay, well, how did he just change what they owe him? That was written in stone, what, what they owe him. The reason why he could change it is because he wasn't really the steward no more. And what can his boss do to him? He's already fired him. That's the worst thing you can do. So he changed the amount so that they save money. And now they on his side. Are y'all learning something? He was a rascal. Come on. He was thinking about himself the whole time. Are you learning something? So what Ali was doing when he said give an account, this was his final report. That's really what it was. When he said give an account of, that you might be, because that threw me off originally. When he said give an account, I, I thought he was giving him a chance. To, uh, he kind of like, uh, well, let me look this over and see. What, no, he fired him. And this, this account was his final report. Okay? So the steward knew he was getting, he, he got fired. So he considered his, his options. Are y'all with me? <laughs> So he was selfish. See, listen, listen. These selfish sinners, sinners, they always think about themselves. Come on, somebody. And they always got a plan, a little hill catching plan to figure out how they're gonna get over. Are y'all learning something? Hallelujah. So the steward had a selfish plan. He was, like I said, he was fired anyway, so his master couldn't do nothing to him. <laughs> So what he did, he said, I'm going to get on their good side. I'm going to make the debtors happy. Are you with me? See, most of it, uh, let me add, the steward definitely wasn't godly. And probably the people that owned the master probably wasn't godly either. Huh? What's the master? Huh? Ain't no saints here, probably. So here we go. Ain't no good people following Jesus. So, now, the people that owe his master money are happy. Because they got a discount. Come on, somebody. Wait, they got a discount that they never should have gotten because the, because the steward ain't steward no more. He didn't have no power. Come on. But this ingratiates him to the debtor. So now they'd be more apt. Huh? Maybe give him a hundred dollars to help him out. Come on, somebody down here ain't working no more. Ain't nobody praying with me. The Bible talks about receiving him into their house. He was thinking, well, hey, well, you know, I got no more money. I might not have a place to stay. Maybe I can, maybe let me stay with you. <laughs> because <I laughs> y'all ain't praying. Maybe, maybe I can stay with you because 
So remember what I did for you. I saved you 20%. Come on, somebody. That's how the world is. They're always thinking of a way to get over. So now, and get this. This was the other part that I used to have a problem with, too. Because the master who had fired the steward, listen, had already fired him, he commended him. I said, what the, but that's, that's cheap, that's lying. <laughs> that ain't what they owed. But the picture that God is painting in this scenario is not that what he did was wrong, but the picture he's painting is that what he did was wise. So he's talking about wisdom. He's not talking about the, the immoral action, but he's talking about the planning that he had. So he could he committed the unjust steward. He didn't commend him on his underhanded activities, but he commended him on thinking and planning a way out. So the master actually praised this steward that he had already fired in the situation. Because he said, you know what, that's pretty smart. <laughs> you know, hallelujah. That's pretty smart, because I can't do nothing to you, because I already fired you. So you lower the amount, that puts you in good stead with them. That's smart. Come on. I didn't get that. So as you drop down to verse 8, you see two types of people being dealt with here in Luke 16. You see the children of this world and the children of light. Somebody say the children of light and the children of the world. The children of the world are people like the unjust steward. <laughs> he was one of the children of the world. Huh? He was underhanded, selfish, a liar, and a cheat. Somebody say children of the world. There are a lot of them out there. Come on. But then it talks about the children of light. That's us. But what God is saying there is we love Jesus and all, but sometimes we ain't as wise. <laughs> ain't nobody praying. He's not saying that you should be... Um, doing the underhanded the lying stuff that the unjust steward did. But what he's saying is, but you ought to plan and think in these scenarios. The, the verse said that, that, the, that the children of this world in their generation are wiser than the children of light. Wisdom, that the whole this whole section is about being wise. Are, are you with me? The Bible says being, and you know, it's sad that it's always the, the evil folk that, that you point to for wisdom. What's the matter? The Bible says be wise as a, a serpent. Why gotta be a serpent? Why is a serpent wise? Come on. Why was the why was the unjust steward wise? It looked like the world. And what that's what God is saying here is the world is has more wisdom in scenarios than the children of, of life. The saints. Are you learning? All right. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise and praising. Are these two now dismissed and we can stand for prayer, please?